energy systems, a topic which is very, very frequently discussed as being a, a harder one, uh, and it's, I think mainly because it's quite, quite difficult to um, conceptualise, it's very difficult to actually sort of see it happening, because we're talking micro detail, we're talking like inside the cells, it's not like we can observe a performer or look at a skill, it's very difficult to actually observe. So it, a lot of it is to do with sort of imagination inside of our brain. And I think because of that, it is quite often seen as being a, a difficult subject. And you know, if, if you are following these specifications um, you know, as they're laid out, it quite often comes in at the start as well, when you know, it's great to know what the energy systems are, so then for the rest of the specification, you're able to apply your understanding. But sometimes it's better to revisit this uh, often throughout the course and you'll see that every time you do revisit it because you've got an understanding of everything else the energy systems starts to make sense as well so if you are tuning in and it's early on in your course don't worry if it is uh, quite confusing at the moment it will begin to make sense throughout the course and obviously if you are joining us towards the end of your course then hopefully by now you're very familiar with, uh, familiar with the terms we're using and the applications of energy systems in sport. So uh, we're going to get right to it uh, with the learning objective today. Uh, there are a couple of breakout sessions uh, within this lesson, but we're primarily going to be doing about anaerobic and aerobic energy transfer, and by that I mean the system. So ATP, PC, the lactic acid system, the anactic system, the ATP, PC system, and then the aerobic system as well. Going through glycolysis, aerobic glycolysis, beta oxidation, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, all the things to do with energy systems. So it's going to be uh, quite a quite a fast paced uh, quite a fast paced lesson but we will be hitting all of the key systems with the terminology, the enzymes, the step-by-step -step chemical reactions, lots of diagrams. So get pen and paper ready to jot down the key phrases, definitions, and get ready to draw the arrows on the different systems. It's going to be yeah, jam-packed full of everything. And then the second part, or maybe not even the second half, probably the last quarter I'm aiming for, uh, will be down to sort of the applications of these energy systems in different sporting contexts. So, you know, what energy can each system produce and what is that energy production best suited for? Fast pace release, slow pace release, explosive energy, long duration, short duration, questions like that. If you are looking for this resource, uh, then if you, I think the link should be in the description below uh, to find it on Google Slides. Um, if it's not there, then it's in the portal. So if you head over to the petutor.com and you should be able to find out where uh, these resources are and how you can get access to them. Right, we'll kick things off. So, learning objective one, to understand energy transfer within each energy system. If you are doing this in a lesson and you do have some opportunity to pause it, then there is a bit of a starter here. So have a little think, why might the body need different ways to generate energy? Why does our body need multiple ways to generate energy? And a second question there, where specifically do we even get energy for movement from? So why do we need multiple ways to get energy? And where do we get energy from? Well, we should be thinking straight away, just from a couple of pictures there, consumption of food. That's our second, second question answer there. We get energy from our food. Now, the, the food itself isn't, that itself isn't the, the fuel source. That's not what we burn or break down and then move as a result. We break food down to release energy Okay, so within the compounds of food structures, like glycogens and triglycerides and things like that, we've got different molecules all bound together with energy bonds. Think about your chemistry now, like covalent bonds and things like that. We've got molecules joined together, and if we were to separate and restructure our food compounds, in the process we can release energy. And that release of energy can create something, or regenerate I should say, because we don't really create energy, we can't create energy, we just transfer it. 
but we regenerate something called adenosine triphosphate. And we're going to be learning about ATP, adenosine triphosphate, so much in this lesson. But that is the, that's the key. That's the fundamental thing that we're going to be looking at. So where do we get energy for movement from? Well, we get it from food, so we can break it down to regenerate ATP. And it's the ATP that we can then use to transfer into muscle contractions. And why do we need multiple ways to generate this ATP? Well, that's based on how our muscles move. They don't always move the same way. They sometimes move maximally. They sometimes move minimally. They move quickly for a short period of time or for a long period of time. So because we've got this variation in how muscles can contract, we also need a variation in how we can you know, give and produce the energy for the variations in muscle contraction. So to strip it all back, what is energy? Well, we have different types, and if you just look at that picture, we've got six different forms, electrical, heat, potential, chemical, atomic, and kinetic. Six different forms of energy. Now, for our body, we consume it. We consume it in the form of chemical energy. And that's that food that I was just talking about there. The, the binds between different molecules on a microscopic level the, the binds between different molecules that make up the foods that we eat, that's what we can break apart, restructure, and in doing so we can release some of this chemical energy for, for use for, or to use for other processes. So energy comes in many forms. It's never lost, as I was saying there about creating energy. We don't really create energy in the body, we just transfer it from one source in order to produce something else that we can then use. Just like wood burns down, but we don't destroy it, it transfers into light and heat. We don't necessarily create light and heat when we have a bonfire, we've just transferred it from wood, which was the store of chemical energy, we convert that into different forms of energy, light, heat, sound of it cracking and popping. Just like we have the cyclist there, looking at third point down. This person on the bike, they've got kinetic energy, movement energy. If they're going downhill, they're probably availing of potential energy, which is the, 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 the force of gravity or the work of gravity on objects. So as gravity pulls something down, that's potential energy. So if this cyclist is, is rolling downhill and they might be pedaling at the same time, that's kinetic and potential energy. Well, when that person goes to brake, and slow down, we don't just get rid of the potential and kinetic energy, we transfer it into possibly the heat energy. Now, as the pads rub against the brake, that friction that we generate, or we might have a squeaky brake, so it, genera or it converts into sound as well. So we've got this transfer of energy all around us, and we've got the same pro or similar processes occurring inside of our body where we consume food, we consume chemical energy, we then have reactions occurring that can convert that chemical energy into kinetic energy, our own movements. And the, the fundamental thing, what it comes down to is ATP. So I said this at the start, adenosine triphosphate. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, where we have an adenosine molecule, we then have three phosphates or three phosphorus molecules. And if we were to bind all of these together, so we have one adenosine and then three phosphate molecules, we create this new compound, adenosine triphosphate. The tri for tricycle, tri meaning three. And it's important to remember that, tri for three, because Next, we're going to be looking at adenosine diphosphate, ADP, because di, if you dissect, means to split into two. Di is for two, tri is for three. So adenosine triphosphate, one adenosine, three phosphate molecules, all bound together. And this is the currency of our body. This is what we use in the, the, most, the most microscopic 
spaces inside our muscle cells. We have adenosine triphosphate compounds, which we break apart and that converts into kinetic energy. If you've ever wondered how we contract a muscle, it's because we've got adenosine triphosphate inside, deep inside our muscle, inside our muscle fibers. And we have enzymes that break these down. And as they break, they cause muscles to move. So even though we consume carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, fiber, it's, it's the breakdown of those that lead to, that almost funnel down into the production of ATP. That's why we eat. We consume food to convert into ATP. It's then ATP that we use inside of our muscles to break down, to convert into movements. And although we have three, and this, this, goes, this goes back to what I was just saying there about ATP and ADP, it's that end phosphate, that end phosphorus that where it's bound, that's where the most energy is stored. That's the, that's, the, that's the bind that we can actually act on to release enough energy for the movements that we want. And we've got enzymes that do that. Enzymes are these, these catalysts. They're chemicals which create change or cause change inside of our body. So if we were to, and this is what you this you definitely need to write down, this is your, your, energy, your energy chemical reaction. This is, this is the formula. ATP, we break that down. So that arrow denotes a chemical reaction, a change. ATP changes into ADP. Adenosine diphosphate. Okay, there are two now. The spare one is now standing by itself, that spare phosphate. And in that process, we release energy. So once that end high energy bond is broken down, we can release energy. ATP changes into ADP plus a spare P plus this release of energy. But once that is broken down, it's done. It's a dead battery. It's depleted. If we were to break down that second energy bond or the first energy bond, it won't have the same effect. We can't do that. Okay, that's not where we get the majority of our energy release, which we can convert into muscle contractions. So this is key, this is the fundamentals, and this is almost the, the starting point, maybe not even the starting point, it's the end point of all the other energy systems that we have, they try and produce ATP, so that we can then take the ATP produced by all the other energy systems, we take that ATP, we then break it down and change it into ADP plus P plus energy. And that's the release that converts into our muscle contractions. So we'll have a look now at aerobic and anaerobic pathways. We know, if I just put it maybe behind me, we know that we need to create ATP. That's the end goal. Because if we can create ATP, we know that we can break that down, release energy, and we can move. I'll just put that a little bit darker. So we know we need to be creating ATP. We have aerobic and we have anaerobic processes that can produce ATP. So these systems alone, they don't allow us to move. Aerobic and anaerobic. Think, think back to GCSE, you've probably heard of aerobic and anaerobic processes with or without oxygen. But these themselves don't allow us to move. They don't cause muscle contractions. The purpose of either of these processes is to produce ATP. And then it's that ATP breakdown that leads to muscle contraction. So these are the two different types of environment of resynthesizing, of regenerating this key ATP. 
Aerobic is when we use oxygen. Anaerobic is when we don't use oxygen. So perhaps if I put an O2 symbol here, and I'll leave the other one blank. So aerobic with oxygen, anaerobic without oxygen. And it is important that our body can use a combination of the two. You know, to train and to only be adept at one, that will put you in a, in a state, let's say, where you are suited very well to some sporting environments but not others. It turns you into an extreme, which you know, if you are, if you are pushing for that, fantastic. If you are pushing to be the world's best sprinter, for example, then training one form and improving one form of energy pathway, that could suit that solo performance. An endurance runner, they might be fantastic at using oxygen and they train to use aerobic pathways so well to regenerate ATP and they do so much of that, which is good for their performance in endurance events, but if they neglect anaerobic training, then they might not have any speed. They might not have quick access to energy. Which goes back to the starter question of why do we need multiple ways to produce energy? Well, it's because sport and our muscles are always facing a variety of demands. So to limit ourselves to training only one pathway, that limits our options of performance. So we need to be able to use both types. It says there on the right hand side, that second point, exercise intensity can fluctuate. Therefore, our production of energy needs to be able to fluctuate as well. And we have three bodily systems. One of which lies in the anaerobic system. Well, I suppose technically we have four systems if you want to be, if you want to be that there's a slight difference between two of them. But we've got two that lie in anaerobic system and then one and a half that lie in the aerobic system. So we're going to start with the anaerobic system because we're dealing with lack of oxygen and that is what happens at the start of exercise. So our first energy system is ATPPC, the alactic system. Okay, so if you've got a pen and paper, this will be your head, ATPPC. And up at the top, you can see a number of different arrows and shapes and bubbles and explosions going on. We'll talk about that in a second. ATP PC system uses phosphocreatine as the fuel. And I'll be talking about fuels a lot from now on. We've got phosphocreatine, we've got carbohydrate or glycogen, and we have triglycerides or fat. Phosphocreatine, carbohydrate, fats. Now, at the moment, we're talking about just phosphocreatine. Don't worry about carbohydrates, glycogen, fats, triglycerides, FFAs. Don't worry about any of those terms. Just phosphocreatine. And what we do with this phosphocreatine is break it down. Now, we've already said how you know, we don't actually convert the food directly into movement. We break food down to release energy to regenerate and resynthesize ATP. Because remember, that is what we need. That is what we can use to move. So that's what we need to be producing. So any fuel source that we need or uh, use, phosphocreatine, carbohydrates, fats, we break those down so that we can produce ATP. And then it's with the ATP that we then break that down in the muscle to move. So how do we use phosphocreatine? Well, phosphocreatine is broken down. If I show you on here, PC, phosphocreatine. So a phosphate molecule and a creatine molecule. Combined, they make this PC compound, this phosphocreatine. And here we have an enzyme, creatine kinase, or creatine kinase, however you want to say it. As long as you can spell it. On your paper. Creatine kinase breaks down phosphocreatine. So enzyme acts on phosphocreatine and the, the result of that is that we split it. We split the phosphocreatine, 
so that we end up with a spare phosphate ion and a creative molecule. So PC was once joined, creatine kinase acts on it, and we separate them. Now I've actually run out of pencil because I've done this too many times, but at this point I normally have a pencil and I snap it. Because that pencil was joined together, that was one thing. But if we break it into two halves, we've now got two separate parts, but there was also a release of sound energy. Now with phosphocreatine, we had that one thing, that one compound. We snap it into two. Phosphate ion, creatine molecule. And just like with the pencil, that would snap and release a sound energy. With this phosphocreatine snapping, we release chemical energy. This exothermic, which is down here, this word here, exothermic reaction. And exothermic means the exiting of energy. There was energy contained within something, we act on it, we change it, and we release energy. So we've now got a release of it. We've got spare energy. We've got this explosion going on here. So phosphocreatine broken down by creatine kinase to produce spare phosphate ion, a creatine molecule, and this release of energy, which is just hanging around, this, this ball of energy with the potential to do something, to change something, to convert into something. And what we do, or what our body does, is it takes this energy and it does some repair work. If we think back to that energy formula, ATP goes to ADP plus P plus energy. If we reverse that, we would have, with the use of energy, we can add P back to ADP to recreate an ATP. That's what we use this energy for. So we've just converted this phosphocreatine fuel into a release of energy which we can then use to regenerate a brand new ATP. So the phosphocreatine doesn't let us, that doesn't convert into movement directly. It converts into the resynthesis of an ATP, which then gets broken down by ATPase to release energy. This relationship between ATP and PC and the constant breakdown of one to rebuild another so that we can break that down again, which then requires the breakdown of another to rebuild it, to then break down those supplies again, that's called a coupled reaction. The release of energy from one side of the equation, phosphocreatine breaking down by creatine kinase into phosphate and creatine, that exothermic release can fuel ADP plus P to resynthesize one ATP. That can then be used for the breakdown in muscle to release energy for kinetic energy. So that's energy system number one. And that is over here, if I could leave myself a little bit bigger for you. So over here on the anaerobic side, we've got the ATP PC system, the alactic system. Alactic because we haven't produced any lactic acid, which you'll learn about in a moment. Alactic with the A at the front means the absence of so the ATP PC system, it's anaerobic because it doesn't require any oxygen. We break down this phosphocreatine, it's correct, phosphate and a creatine, with the release of energy that can fuel the ADP plus P, which regenerates an ATP, which is what we are after. Quick, simple, very few enzymes, 
but we haven't got much PC, and we'll cover that later on. Ooh. So, next one, we have anaerobic glycolysis. Fancy words there, anaerobic and glycolysis. Anaerobic meaning it doesn't, still doesn't require oxygen to complete these processes. Glycolysis, this gives you a clue as to what fuel source we're now converting. So, phosphocreatine was our first fuel source. Glycolysis uses glycogen. And glycogen derives from carbohydrate. So, fossil creatine was for the ATP PC system. Our second one is going to be anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis. And what happens here? Well, glycogen, just looking at the first paragraph here, glycogen is broken down by the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase. And we call the product of that glucose. So we're up here. Glycogen gets broken down, that blue arrow, into glucose by what? Glycogen phosphorylase. So again, remember, an enzyme is a catalyst. It's something which creates change inside the body. It's a chemical. Glycogen phosphorylase breaks down glycogen into glucose. Now, glucose needs to be broken down into something else called pyruvic acid. What causes that? Phosphofructokinase, PFK, phosphofructokinase. And in that process, in that conversion from glucose to pyruvic acid, energy bonds are shifted and moved and broken and restructured, and just like with our phosphocreatine getting broken apart released energy, so too does glucose. Glucose being broken down into pyruvic acid releases energy and there's enough energy to refuel ADP plus P twice. I'll say that again. When we break glucose down into pyruvic acid using the enzyme phosphofructokinase, we release enough energy to complete two lots of adenosine diphosphate plus phosphate, creating one ATP. And we can do that twice. So we say that the energy yield for anaerobic glycolysis, anaerobic because we're not using oxygen, glycolysis because we're using glycogen into glucose into pyruvic acid, the energy yield is two ATP. Now the energy yield for the ATP PC system or one phosphocreatine ksh, created one ATP. So the energy yield for the ATP PC system was one. Whereas the anaerobic glycolysis is two. Might be easier if I take those away. So energy yield of one for ATP PC system, the energy yield of two for the anaerobic glycolysis. It's the role of these enzymes. We're using glycogen phosphorylase, we're using phosphofructokinase to start off with a big chunky carbohydrate to break that down into a smaller glycogen, to then break that down into a smaller glucose, to then break that down into pyruvic acid. As we break all of that down, so like that pencil analogy, snap it once, we release energy. Snap it again, release energy. Snap it again, release more energy. It's still essentially the same thing, but it's just in different parts, probably missing a few bits and pieces during the snapping process. Just like this. I always compare it to a big bar of Cadbury's chocolate. Now imagine you've got one of them one kilo bars. That's a carbohydrate. Too big to eat in one mouthful or in one go, potentially and you snap it into perhaps rows, or you snap it into quarters. Well, as we break the carbohydrate down, that big one kilo bar, we break that down into four separate glycogens. But that's still a little bit too big for one mouthful. So we need to break it down into something smaller. 
we need to break it down into glucose. So we snap off all of the individual squares from each glycogen quarter of that one big carbohydrate. Now those tiny little glucose, that is manageable. That is something that we can consume and transport very easily. And that is what we break down into pyruvic acid and in the process releasing enough energy for two ATP for ADP plus P plus energy, ADP plus P plus energy, creating two ATP. Now pyruvic acid, it requires oxygen to be broken down any further. And at the moment, as we are in anaerobic glycolysis, we don't have oxygen. Therefore pyruvic acid can't just sit there. It's got nowhere to go because there's no oxygen yet. We can't break it down any further. So we have to turn it into something else. And we turn it into lactic acid. You've probably heard of this. Lactic acid is that, it's, the, it's a substance inside your muscle when you're working hard that starts to burn, starts to make your legs feel heavy and fatigued, tired. You can't contract as well. Lactic acid is the byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis. So before when I was telling you the ATP PC system was called the lactic, sorry, <laughs> The ATP PC system is the alactic system because it doesn't produce lactic acid. Well, what we're talking about now, the anaerobic glycolysis stage, that's the lactic acid system because we're producing lactic acid. So I want you to think now, when or what sort of movements do you have to produce in order to create lactic acid in your muscle to make you feel uncomfortable? When do you experience lactic acid? Going out for a walk? Playing darts? Playing snooker? Going for a light jog? Lying down? Or is it sprinting? Is it doing wall sits? Is it doing as many press ups in a row as you can? Is it doing the bleep test? Those higher intensity movements where you're working hard for a maximal period of time, that's when we use lactic, or that's when we use the lactic acid system. That's when we have to rely on anaerobic systems because we can't, we can't breathe in enough oxygen to break down enough aerobically to produce enough ATP to sustain that high intensity movement. We have to rely on systems which don't require oxygen. But the trade-off of that is that we produce lactic acid as a result. Now this is starting to lead into what we're going to talk about towards the end, to do with use in sport. But right now, what you need to know is anaerobic glycolysis. Glycogen to glucose to pyruvic acid to release enough energy for 2 ATP. But without oxygen, we store pyruvic acid as lactic acid, and we use the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase to complete that conversion. So aerobic glycolysis, the difference, we now have oxygen because it's aerobic. Now this happens after anaerobic glycolysis. In fact, the way that we're dealing with them today is time ordered. We use the ATP PC system first, that's instant energy. Anaerobic glycolysis, that's pretty much instant. Now it kicks in after about five, six, seven seconds of movement, but with the production of lactic acid, it quickly burns out. It quickly tires us out and we have to stop. But if we have a moderate intensity and we can sustain exercise and we allow our body enough time to get oxygen in, that's when we can start to use aerobic glycolysis. So yes, we have oxygen available, but in order to get to that pyruvic acid, so remember where we were talking about pyruvic acid, and in order to break it down any further, if I just move myself. Oh. So as you can see here, okay, this is the this is the anaerobic system, okay, that just took place. That was our glycogen to glucose to pyruvic acid. Now in order for pyruvic acid 
to get broken down further. Yes, we add oxygen to it, but we still have to start with glycogen. We still have to go through the initial stages of anaerobic glycolysis. But because we've got O2 present, we no longer need to convert pyruvic acid into lactic acid. Instead, we add a few more enzymes to it, coenzyme A, oxaloacetic acid, and we produce something called citric acid. Okay, I know you're probably thinking there's no oxygen there yet, but the oxygen is available later on in the chemical reaction sequence. And it's because oxygen is available later on, it allows this sort of chain reaction to start. It allows pyruvic acid to be taken and added to, or uh, coenzyme A added to it, and oxaloacetic acid added to it. And eventually we create citric acid. Why do we need to create citric acid? Just flash this up and then move myself. It's because citric acid is allowed to enter the Krebs cycle. Now the Krebs cycle is a series of chemical reactions taking place inside the mitochondria, the matrix of the mitochondria. So far, the anaerobic glycolysis, okay, everything on this side, that's happening inside the muscle sarcoplasm, the space around the mitochondria, the space around the muscle cells. Okay, I've often described it as, imagine if you had a, a packet of you know, dry spaghetti, each spaghetti is a muscle fiber, but if you were to pour water into the packet, there's obviously space that the, that the spaghetti is in. Well, that space, that the water inside that packet of spaghetti, that's your sarcoplasm. That's where everything so far has been taking place. ATPPC, with the phosphocreatin breakdown, anaerobic glycolysis. But now, because we've had enough time, oxygen has worked its way into the spaghetti, into the muscle fibers, into the cells in to the mitochondria and that's where the Krebs cycle takes place. So glycogen broken to glucose, glucose broken to pyruvic acid in anaerobic glycolysis. We release energy for 2ATP but now there's oxygen available inside the mitochondria. We take pyruvic acid, we add coenzyme A and oxaloacetic acid to produce citric acid and citric acid can now be put almost on this this conveyor belt of reactions, this conveyor belt where citric acid is, how can we say it? We extract CO2 from it, we, and in, in the process, so we, 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 how can I say it? We have citric acid, we remove the carbon, okay, so obviously carbon is a constituent of glycogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all mushed together. Pyruvic acid comes into the Krebs cycle. If we take out the carbon and add it to some oxygen which is nearby, we produce CO2. So we've just broken carbon off, citric acid, we snap it off, and as we know, when we snap the, the uh, two compounds, we release energy. That energy can be used for ATP, 2 ATP, which is down here. So we've got rid of some, C, uh, some carbon, which is produced carbon dioxide, which is why we need adoption as well. In, in the process of doing that, we've released energy for 2 ATP, and we can also take out hydrogen. So hydrogen can now be extracted from this citric acid. I'm gonna cover what happens to that in a moment. What's left over? Well, a bit of recycling. The oxaloacetic acid gets taken back out, and that can help join the next batch of pyruvic acid to regenerate some new citric acid, which then repeats this process. We take some carbon out to produce CO2. That releases energy for 2 ATP. We take some hydrogen out for some future processes, which leaves the remains oxaloacetic acid to go back and recycle. Hydrogen. You'll notice, all that is there is the mitochondrial matrix. You'll notice that we've got the Krebs cycle just here and the hydrogen we just took out is now 
entered into this next stage. This next stage is called the electron transport chain. Still aerobic. So at the moment, on our aerobic side, we've got the Krebs cycle, and we've got the electron transport chain, the ETC. And this is where the magic happens. Because the electron transport chain, this allows the hydrogen to pass through the crystal, the central part of the mitochondria. And as it does this, because hydrogen is by itself, we can start to, to move the positive ions, the positively charged hydrogen, and the negatively charged hydrogen. We can start to separate these. And in doing that, we, we create this, this chemical gradient. We create, it's almost, it's not going to be magnetized, but imagine if you had you know, a magnet put onto positive and a magnet put onto negative, obviously opposites attract. And if you were to put them close enough, there would be this, this pull, this gradient, this difference between magnet or magnetic positive and magnetic negative. This difference creates this charge in between, this potential for energy. And by doing the same thing with hydrogen, by putting positive hydrogen and negative hydrogen on either side, we sort of split them and separate them, but keep them close enough that we generate potential because they want to mix again and we're keeping them apart. This, this production of chemical energy, we can use this to fuel ATP resynthesis. And we can use that for, to resynthesize 34 ATP. 34. So far, we've got an en energy yield of one. We've got an energy yield for two in anaerobic glycolysis. We've got an energy yield of two in the Krebs cycle. But that one batch of hydrogen that comes down and we separate into positive and negative, we can generate 34 new ATP from this one completed process. Now once hydrogen is used and it's finished with, we add it to the oxygen because we're in an aerobic process, H plus O, H2O, water. So if we think about the byproducts that we've gone through now in aerobic energy, well following anaerobic glycolysis we had pyruvic acid and the pyruvic acid was converted to citric acid. Citric acid went round the Krebs cycle and we released CO2 and energy. The hydrogen then came into the electron transport chain and after a series of chemical processes, that hydrogen attached to some more spare oxygen to produce H2O, to produce water. So glycogen plus oxygen leads to the production of energy, the production of carbon dioxide, and the production of water. Now that would probably be the, the chemical formula that you were given in GCSE level, be it PE, science, whatever. That's the, that's the formula that you, that you probably know already. And you're probably thinking, well, where did that CO2 and water come from? Well, this is where. During aerobic energy pathways, during the extraction of carbon to release energy to resynthesize ATP. That carbon attaches onto oxygen to release, to produce and release carbon dioxide. That remaining hydrogen carries on further and then eventually attaches onto more surplus oxygen, producing H2O, water. All the while, as these restructuring events occur and releases of energy, these exothermic releases of energy occur, we can use that to produce ATP. Because then with ATP, we can break that down into ADP plus P plus energy. And that energy fuels movement. So, this is, this is everything. Not ATP, PC, but from anaerobic glycolysis. So we start with glycogen up at the top. Glycogen phosphorylase acts on glycogen to produce glucose. 
phosphofructokinase acts on glucose to produce pyruvic acid, in the process releasing energy for 2 ATP. But at the moment there's no oxygen. Therefore pyruvic acid is converted into lactic acid through the enzyme activity of lactate dehydrogenase. Anaerobic glycolysis happening in the sarcoplasm. Now that there's oxygen available, we're about 60 seconds, 90 seconds, two minutes into exercise. The cardiorespiratory system has responded to our movements. O2 is being delivered to the muscle and working tissue. The pyruvic acid can now convert bish bash bosh into citric acid because of the actions of coenzyme A and oxaloacetic acid. The citric acid can now enter the Krebs cycle, which is a series of rotational chemical reactions during which carbon is taken out, producing CO2. During that snapping process of carbon, that releases energy for 2 ATP. We've taken out carbon, that leaves us with hydrogen. Everything else, oxaloacetic acid, that can go back in to future reactions. This hydrogen then comes out into the electron transport chain deep inside the mitochondria, the cristae of the mitochondria. Hydrogen, oh, hydrogen is sorted into positive and negative. This difference in positive and negative creates this chemical, grade, uh, chemical gradient, this potential, and that potential energy can fuel the resynthesis of 34 ATP, energy yield of 34. Now that we're done with the hydrogen, hydrogen can't just hang around, it's pretty unstable by itself. H plus oxygen, H2O, water. No lactic acid here. Clean production of water. Carbon dioxide, harmful, not harmful, I should say, but too much of it starts to increase and play around with acidity, and acidity impacts enzymes. So too much carbon dioxide is not good. That's why our cardiorespiratory system is taking it, putting it into the blood, and then getting it out of the blood. So there are three main systems, ATPPC, anaerobic glycolysis, and then aerobic glycolysis, using the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. The ATPPC system, that relies on phosphocreatine as the fuel. Everything else that we've spoken about relies on glycogen as a fuel. Beta oxidation is using fats or triglycerides, or as they're also called, free fatty acids. Now, free fatty acids require more oxygen than everything else. Okay, roughly speaking, about 15 to 20% surplus. So if you're exercising and you run out of glycogen, think three or four hours into a marathon, if you run out of glycogen, you'll have to reduce your movement by 15 to 20%, but keep your respiration and your cardiorespiratory system at the same level of activity. So that drop in movement will create this extra volume of oxygen that's gonna come into the body for us to access free fatty acids. Well, that second point there just says they do require a larger presence of oxygen than glycogen, but they can last for longer. So how do we actually use them? Well. It's this, acetyl coenzyme A. Because if we think back, I'll just quickly bring it back to here. At this point here, so following aerobic glycolysis, pyruvic acid is converted into acetyl coenzyme A when we add the enzyme coenzyme A. Well, acetyl coenzyme A, if I quickly flick ahead, if we take a free fatty acid, so triglycerides, but the, it's the ends of a big block of fat which we're able to pull apart from it if we add oxygen to it. This process snaps this free fatty acid off from this big triglyceride, this big fat molecule, or fat compound I should say. We snap off a section of it which is free to be oxidized that we can add oxygen to and take it away we add oxygen to it and we can convert it into acetyl coenzyme A. We basically skipped aerobic glycolysis. 
we started instead with free fatty acids over here instead of glycogen. We took the free fatty acids, we pumped extra oxygen into it, we snapped it off, and we created acetyl coenzyme A. Now, that acetyl coenzyme A substance can be added to oxaloacetic acid to produce citric acid, and everything else we've just done completes as normal. But we just started with a different fuel source. But it takes extra oxygen. So now, going back to the very first question that, that, that I asked you, why do we need multiple ways to generate energy? We move in different ways. Right now, I'm standing up, I'm moving a little bit, I'm not running or anything, I'm not playing sports, my cardiorespiratory system is probably just above resting levels, I've probably got a surplus of oxygen inside of my body. And fat is going to last as a fuel source so much longer than glycogen and phosphocreatine. So right now my body is being as efficient as it can. It's chipping off tiny parts of my fat molecules. It's using the excess oxygen that I have available. And then it's completing energy release, getting 34 ATP down at the bottom, from one free fatty acid. Why would it use glycogen? Because the body knows that glycogen can be used at higher intensities. I'm going to keep my glycogen, I'm going to protect my glycogen stores, because I know that if I did suddenly go for a run, my body can use glycogen anaerobically within the first 30 seconds to produce the energy. It can't use the free fatty acids at high intensity, but it can use them at low intensity. So because we move differently, because there's always a variation in energy demands, we need different energy pathways to service us at those different intensities. That's what I was saying just then, in that blue paragraph. Furthermore, gram for gram, FFAs, free fatty acids, triglyceride, fat sources, gram for gram, they can be used for longer. They can complete more ETC cycles. They can complete more Krebs cycles. There's more of it to go around. So the body can use one gram of fat for longer than one gram of glycogen to produce the same amount of energy. The only trade-off, free fatty acids, they require more oxygen. So we don't always have that option available. Because if I suddenly went into a brisk jog, I wouldn't have that surplus. My cardiorespiratory system would be working at high intensity and there wouldn't be spare oxygen going around, so I wouldn't be able to access the fat. So, some time out tasks. And I think we're going to we're going to leave it there for today because that was a lot of a lot of information and we did sort of touch on uh, sort of sporting applications throughout that. So we are going to hold it there for today. But there are a couple of questions or tasks for you to go away and do now. And it's mainly to summarise the energy systems that we've just been looking at. So what are the enzymes at play in the ATP PC system, in anaerobic glycolysis, in aerobic glycolysis, in the Krebs cycle, in the electron transport chain? What are the enzymes? What are the catalysts for change? And then... What's the difference between aerobic and anaerobic? And although we're going to be doing it next lesson, have a think. What sporting implications might there be for the differences in these energy pathways? So that's what you need to be thinking about. So have a look through those questions. Uh, obviously, after this, after this class, you can pause it. If you're on demand, you can rewind it uh, as much as you like. Um, but yeah, have a look at those questions. Really get to grips with those diagrams. So like I said at the start, it's quite difficult to conceptualise sort of how these work because we're talking microscopic. So by seeing them on diagrams, that's an easier way to remember what works with what. Because if you can remember a diagram, you can talk through that. Glycogen broken into such and such, broken into such and such. Enzyme acts on that. If you can see it, it's easier to describe it. So. That's what I would recommend. Go back through the lesson, pause it on different slides, have a go at answering some of these questions and see how you get on. But yeah, we will hold it there for today. 
Uh, so if I quickly fly back to the very start, there we go. So we've looked at anaerobic energy transfer and aerobic energy transfer, and we've touched on how we can produce different amounts of energy, our energy yields, one, two, two, and 34, how we can produce them and how that might start to impact the intensity of our movement. So that was the introductory lesson really to energy systems. So I hope you found that useful. Um, by all means, go back through it and watch it as many times as you need to. Um, and obviously the questions are there for you to, for you to use. The link to the slides should be uh, taken to Google. Um, so you can use those Google slides to, uh, to revisit yourself as well. Uh, but yeah, to discover more just like this, then head over to the pgtutor.com uh, where you can find out how else we're helping students, be it one-to-one, -one, group classes, uh, the portals, the resource shop, a YouTube channel, everything. Uh, so yeah, head on over, have a little look around, uh, and then feel free, to, feel free to reach out. I've been Johnny, uh, this has been AWPE group classes, I hope you enjoyed it, and yeah, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye now.